this is Joe from the Chester Inn Museum. Uh, welcome to our next stop on the virtual field trip day. Uh, so normally, a uh, field trip here at the Chester Inn uh, includes uh, some form of a tour of our upstairs. Um, normally, uh, if things get pushed behind, we actually just do the second floor. Today, we're definitely doing the third floor. So uh, come on in, we're gonna look around. Uh, and what we're gonna do today is a, a look around our lodging room. Uh, it only makes sense that we have a lodging room here that we do a tour of since this is a hotel. Uh, so one of the first things that we do um, with this building as an inn is bring up the question of who would be traveling here to Jonesboro uh, in the late 1700s throughout the 1800s. Um, and that answer is a lot of people uh, and for a lot of different reasons. Um, but one of the main reasons that this inn is here where it's located on Main Street is because of the courthouse. Uh, so the, the courthouse was really the, the main draw for, uh, for the town and in the late 1700s William Chester decided to build an inn here uh, as a means to try to actually attract uh, travelers here to stay for the night, uh, offer them food as well. So uh, this here is one of the lodging rooms that would have been here. Now when the inn was first built, um, it was basically this half of the building that we're in. So if you look at the building from across the street, it's the right half of the building. Uh, the second floor was reserved for the public space, um, dining room and parlor room. Uh, the third floor was reserved for lodging. Uh, so one of the earliest descriptions that we have of the inn was that it was five window, ba uh, window bays long. Uh, so if you look here at this wall uh, across from me, you can see two windows, uh, then there's one in the hall, and then two more in the office uh, across from me, um, which gives us an indication of how long the inn was. Uh, but the sleeping would have all been done here in the lodging room. Now, travel has changed quite a bit uh, over the years. So looking around this room, and you can, we're not in the room, but you can get a sense for, for how big this room is. Um, how many people do you think might have slept here? Now, I'll give you a couple of options to choose from. If you think it's two to three because of the beds, or do you think it's 10 or more? Now, if you chose 10 or more, you are very possibly correct. Um, one of the things about the room here in the, especially when it was first built in the late 1700s, is they would sleep as many people as would be comfortable sleeping here. Um, that means that the beds would fill up, and then people would sleep on the floor, um, and really it was however many people would want to sleep here, because even if you're sharing this room with 15 or 20 people, it's still better than being outside. Uh, a lot of the travel here, especially early on in the late 1700s, early 1800s, uh, was done by individual groups of um, mail travelers. Um, a lot of people coming in town, maybe just for a night or two for the courthouse. Uh, so that, it wasn't unexpected if you came here and found out that 10 other people were sleeping in the room and you just sort of tagged along with them. That was not really uncommon. It's a little strange for us today, but it was, it was not the case uh, in the late 1700s. Now, looking around the room, um, this is one of the largest rooms that we have. Um, most of the in rooms that were added later were a little bit smaller. Uh, by the late 1800s, which is when this inn is restored to, uh, you, you wouldn't have necessarily seen that many people sleeping in here. Um, this room still would have been a sort of a public room and you might still be sharing this room with other travelers you had never met before, um, but it's very likely that you, you'd at least have your own bed um, in here. Now, the two beds that are in here, um, first off, let me say, we don't know exactly what the beds that they had here looked like. Um, the two beds that are in here were not used by the inn. Uh, they were donated to us by Patricia, uh, Patricia McLean. Um, they were from her family. Uh, they were made in the late 1800s. They provide us with a really good example of the types of beds that were made, uh, handmade, in the late 1800s, so it fits in with our, with our time period. Um, we do know, based on advertising and descriptions of people who stayed here, um, Dating back to the late 1700s, it seems like they never used road beds. So if you've been to places like Rocky Mount or Tiffin Haynes, you might be 
uh, familiar with, with what a rope bed is. Um, they were fairly common, especially in this area, which would have been sort of like the West uh, in the late 1700s. Um, as far as we can tell, they always had beds that had frames and mattresses, and they always advertised that their beds were really, really comfortable. Not that they would lie to us in advertising, um, but as far as we know, the beds would have been something similar to the beds that we have here, which these beds are not row beds. Um, but if you were here in the late 1700s, the style would be a little bit different, and there probably wouldn't be as many items in the room. Um, so looking around, another thing that we like to talk about, especially on field trips, is this is an in room. Uh, you have a lot of travelers here overnight. So where do you think the bathroom might be looking around this room? Now, you can feel free to answer in the comments or answer amongst yourselves as you're watching. Um, I'll give you another option. How many of you think that the, that the bathroom is behind this door? Let's find out. That is not the bathroom. It is just another entrance out into the hallway. Um, so if you're wondering where the bathroom is, there was none. Uh, there was no indoor plumbing in here uh, throughout the 1800s. Uh, so a couple of things in this room show us how they would have um, utilized bathroom facilities. One, uh, under the bed here, if you look, this would be, um, your bathroom. Uh, this is a chamber pot um, that would have been used for uh, the purpose of um, using the bathroom if you were here in the room, especially overnight. Um, we do, uh, we think that there would have been an outhouse facility as well on the back side of the property, um, so you would have had that option as well. And then if you uh, scroll over here, you would have had not a bathtub or shower, obviously, um, but you would have had. Um, a pitcher, a wash basin, soap, uh, those sorts of things on hand, um, linens and towels like, likely would have been available as well. Uh, so you could have actually you know, washed your hand, washed your face, done some basic getting ready, um, either in the morning or at night, however you wanted to. So this is one of the things that an that in inn in the 1800s in this area likely would have had on hand uh, for their patrons to, to utilize. Uh, some other things that we have that sort of go along with that. Um, over here we have some utensils um, that would have been used for you know, grooming, uh, so, uh, self-care, getting ready, uh, including a razor, which is um, a little dangerous to use today because uh, it's a little bit rusty. Uh, we also have um, little other toiletries here, um, things for grooming, things for brushing, um, this here is a button hook, but is all, normally one of the things that is, um, I'll point that out here, uh, normally one of the things that, especially on field trips, students like to point out because um, it seems like it's some sort of grisly dental tool, uh, but it, it's uh, just a tool for, um, for button hooking, uh, which is also going to lead us to our uh, next question to talk about, um, the clothing. So. If you watched the Oak Hill School video, um, Anne was um, sort of dressed like you would have seen someone in the, in the late uh, 19th century, especially at the Oak Hill Schoolhouse. I obviously am not. Uh, so if you look at me, I'm obviously not dressed like someone from the 19th century. But if you can look at me and think, you don't look like you're from the 19th century, then that means you have some idea of what people in the 19th century would have dressed as. So one of the things that we also talk about in this room um, is the style of clothing. Now, right now it's May. Uh, it's a little bit warm today. Last week it wasn't as warm, but uh, it's East Tennessee, so it comes and goes. Um, but on a day like today, you know, we can wear shorts, short sleeves, um, maybe sandals or flip-flops. Um, that was not the case. Uh, if you were walking around the streets of Jonesboro, May, June, July, even if it's really, really hot, um, you'd be wearing pretty similar clothing year round. Uh, so a lot of the clothes tended to be long sleeves. Um, as I mentioned with the button hook, lots of buttons for both men and women's clothing. Uh, so you can see here, uh, buttons all the way down uh, this item of clothing. Uh, you also would see hats, um, both again for men and women. Uh, the style of hat that has changed a little bit. So again, if you're walking around Jonesboro today, 
Um, you might see something like a baseball hat or a baseball cap. Um, that is not the case. Uh, top hats, bowler hats, those sorts of things would have been common uh, in the 19th century for men. Uh, and women would have had all different uh, variety of hats as well. Um, typically very large hats. So uh, that was a, a common piece of um, item that you saw. You also would see, uh, in addition to long sleeves, um, coats. Uh, so if I was here in the 19th century, not only would I have my sleeves rolled down, um, I would also probably have an overcoat on as well. Again, even if it's May, June, uh, or July, women uh, likely would have at least one layer of uh, a long dress and possibly one or two longer under layers as well. Uh, over here, we do have examples of bed clothing. Again, this is a, a lodging room. Um, most of your time at the inn would have been spent in the public space, either downstairs in the parlor room or dining room. Really, the, the, the lodging room was just a place to sleep. Um, it was a place to keep your clothes if you were traveling with clothing, um, get ready, whatever. Most of your time would have been spent outside of this room. But we do have examples of um, sort of nightgowns that would have been worn both um, for adult, adult males and females, and also an example of uh, sort of a, a child's uh, dress here. As you can see, they're all very similar in style. Um, and the, the sort of long uh, fabric was seen as comfort uh, and comfortable for um, sleepwear in the 19th century. Uh, one other thing to point out about the clothing, if you'll notice, uh, the clothes that we do have here are featured in two trunks. Uh, if you are traveling here at the inn, um, it's possible that you might have had a trunk with you. Uh, if you had enough clothes to travel or if you were traveling for a long enough period to have a trunk, not only did that mean that you had stuff with you, that also meant that you probably had some measure of money or wealth, that you actually afforded enough clothes and items to carry around in a trunk, and that you could also actually afford a trunk. Uh, so also, just looking at these two trunks here, the trunk on the left is larger, which meant it's more expensive, and if you were traveling with a, a larger trunk, uh, that again is a sort of statement of possibly how much money that you, that you actually have with you. Um, now, if you're looking around this room, one thing that we like to do um, with, with students especially is to try to pick out what's different between the 19th century and today. Uh, so look around the room here uh, and talk amongst yourselves or, or write this down if you have our um, packet of questions. Uh, try, to, try to pick out things that may or may not have been here. Um, in the 19th century. Either something that you're looking around and you think, I don't think that would be here uh, that long ago, or something that, yeah, that seems like that would be here. Um, and I'll, I'll give you a few, uh, few seconds to sort of look, or look around and, and think about that, and then I'll talk about one or two major ones that, that normally stick out. So one thing um, that would definitely not be here, and it's a little bit hard to see, but right here is a heated and air duct, and right now some very wonderful air-conditioned air is coming out. Um, we have that luxury of heating and air systems, so if it's hot, we can cut the air on, if it's cold, we'll cut the heat on. Um, that was not the case uh, in the 19th century, so this would not have been here. Uh, in the 19th century, your heating system was right here. Uh, one of the things that was consistent about the inn, uh, whenever they advertised or ran advertisements for the inn, one of the things that always came up is that they had fireplaces in every room. That was almost like an amenity for a hotel today. That was something that would attract people here. You could get a room, even if you're sharing it with someone, whatever room you were staying in did have a fireplace. Uh, so the, there are um, fireplaces in each room still today, so this is um, something that would have been used a lot in the 19th century, but if it's a hot day and you need to try to cool down, you've got very large windows. Uh, so if you look around this room here, the windows go not quite, but almost floor to ceiling, um, so you can open that up, you can get quite a bit of a cross breeze here. Um, this room has six very large open windows, so 
this, this would be a great way to air, uh, air the room out uh, just a little bit. Um, now, one of the most common questions that, that people ask or um, that comes up a lot, especially here in the lodging room, is how much did it cost? Uh, how much was it for a room here? Uh, we don't know precisely um, year by year how much it cost here. Um, we have some like county guidelines um, about five to ten years before the inn was built um, that recommended prices for, uh, for inns and, and those sorts of things in the area. Um, but it's much older uh, system than we use, still use shillings. Um, what's interesting, when the inn was first built, um, the room itself, your sleeping area, was one of the least expensive things that you paid for. Uh, typically, things like hot meals and a place, a stable for your horse were actually more expensive than your room. But again, if you're sharing this room with 10 or 15 people, you're really just paying for a spot to sleep, so that, that kind of makes sense. Um, by the late 1800s, so right around 1890, 1900, which is again the time period that we're restored to, um, the price uh, was advertised on their ledger books as being about $2 a night. And now we don't know if they adjusted that rate or not, but that, that is one thing that we have seen uh, come up in our records pretty specifically. Um, so if you want, uh, as you're watching this video, feel free to um, chime in, write, or ask any questions, and we will try to answer as many, many of those as possible. Um, and if we don't get a chance to answer your question here during the live stream, we'll try to go back and uh, either answer in the comments or um, try to answer them and, and put those answers together for you to, to look at. So uh, are there any questions so far that have come in? So yeah, we have a couple about some other things people pointed out that probably wouldn't have been here. Like, can you talk about the lights? Yes, uh, so that is something that comes up a lot, um, especially the style of lights that we have in, in their location. Uh, so again, we're restored to the, to, um, the 1890s time period. So on the inside of the building, a lot of our um, stuff was just not here. So we had to, to do a lot of bringing items in, such as the beds, uh, which are original to the time period, and then um, model things um, after what they would have looked like in the 19th century. The light fixtures are a good example of this. Um, so right here, I'm by our electric station, right? So this is our heat and air system. Uh, this is our light switch cuts on and off. Um, in the 19th century, that would not have been the case. Uh, what's interesting about the lights here, and one of my little sort of favorite things to talk about, um, the light fixtures that we have um, are modeled after um, sort of gas light fixtures, which would have been here quite a bit throughout the latter half of the 1800s. So from you know the 1870s, 1880s on, uh, what's interesting is by 1900, um, we don't know exactly when, but it seems like by 1900, there actually was uh, electric lighting here at the end. Now again, we don't know, we don't have a lot of records or specifics about, about that or when that happened, uh, but we, we know that at least downstairs um, in the commercial part of the end, at, uh, around 1900, there was a barber shop. The barber shop had electric lighting. So it's very possible that by, by um, the 1890s, there actually might have been ele electric lighting here. Now it would have looked very different. Um, it would have been hazardous. <laughs> there would have been a lot of uh, wires and, and things. Um, uh, late 1800s electric lighting was not the safest. Um, but, so that, that's an interesting thing to, to think about. Um, but if it hadn't been electric lighting, then it would have likely been some sort of gas light. Now here, um, the ceiling at this height probably would not have had a gas light that close to it, um, which is uh, something to, to consider. But yeah, that, that is a good thing to point out. The, the lights would definitely not have looked like this or, or operated like this uh, in the 1890s. Um, you said something about the ceiling. So you're pretty tall. Yes. So why are the ceilings so short up here? So the ceiling height uh, normally comes up. Uh, what's interesting is uh, you can pick out when, when questions come up. The ceiling height normally comes up most on this room uh, than any others because it's a little bit lower than the other uh, than the other rooms. So this ceiling is right right comfortably around seven feet. It's very um, very tight space. Um, now the ceiling height um, the ceilings are a little bit lower uh, in this building than some of the, the more modern buildings that, that you go into. 
Uh, and there are different reasons that go into it. Um, you know, keep the rooms a little bit cooler. So on a day like today, a smaller ceiling like this, um, if we open these windows up, you can actually cross breeze here pretty easily. In the winter, uh, or if it's cold at night, if you had the fireplace going, you can actually keep the heat in this room a little bit better. Um, also, the ceiling's a little bit lower on this floor because um, there is an attic space above us. Um, the attic space was used. Um, we don't know exactly how it was used, uh, we're actually going to talk a little bit about that, the attic space of, uh, itself. Um, we've got a video coming later today that's going to talk a little bit about the attic and show you a little bit about that. Um, but the attic is right above us. Now, if you look out, um, just out here in the hallway, when you come up the stairs, um, based on some of the architectural layout of the building, um, it seemed like the attic, the original attic entrance was on the other side of that office door. And it was almost like a staircase, almost like a fourth floor. Uh, again, we don't know precisely if that's how that was situated or oriented or exactly um, how that would have been used. So, but yeah, that, that's, that's what would have been going on above us. Now, um, any, do I have time for any, any more questions? Uh, yeah, I've got just one more. It's about gowns. So we see nightgowns everywhere. Mm -hmm. So did everybody wear a nightgown? Um, that's a good question. Uh, it seems like um, if you had, uh, if you were able to um, afford a nightgown, that it, that it seems um, it seems likely that that would have been uh, been the case uh, that you would have had um, some sort of sleep attire. And it, in the 19th century, that was a, a fairly common common style. So yeah, it, it seems seems reasonable that. Um, most people would have been wearing, if not that exact thing, something similar to it for, for sleeping. And I know people that, that, that have sworn that they still wear things like this because it is uh, the most comfortable thing to sleep in. So. All right. All right. Well, um, if you have any other questions, feel free to keep uh, commenting and, and we'll try to get back and answer as many as we can. Uh, so right now we're going to take a pause and head over to the Christopher Taylor house and talk a little bit about the, uh, the Taylor house.